So hopefully you all can see this um, PowerPoint. So our evolving understanding of after-death communication in the age of COVID. And as I mentioned, Noel was unable to join us today because of a faculty commitment there at William and Mary. Uh, but this, she and I had developed this um, PowerPoint together anyway, and I've presented a variation of it before. So this is uh, very familiar territory for me. So mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to presenting it to you. Um, so in this presentation, um, we're, I'm gonna start with the definition of ADC, then summarize the research on spontaneous ADC, the types, the circumstances, the frequency, incidence, and prevalence, experience or demographics and culture, effects and disclosure issues around ADC, and then give you some recent examples of ADC coverage in the media and some strengths and weaknesses of the ways ADC is um, being presented in the media, and some recommended responses and resources for you. So we begin with the definition, and this comes from Jenny Streithorn's dissertation, which I'll be telling you about here in a minute uh, more, that she defined it as a phenomenon in which a living person has a feeling or sense of direct contact with a physically deceased person or animal. Most ADC is spontaneous, meaning that it's um, unexpected, unplanned, unsought, uh, it happens unexpectedly. Um, it can be facilitated. There's a, tech, a counseling technique called induced after-death communication, which a, a better word really is facilitated. Um, but uh, we won't be talking, we won't be focusing on that in this presentation. We'll be talking about the spontaneous type of experience that's what most people have experienced. And so uh, research on spontaneous ADC uh, First of all, in 2011, Jenny uh, did her dissertation, a systematic review of all published research on ADC from uh, the earliest study she could find in the late 1800s to the most recent one she could find in 2006. And uh, there were 35 such studies in, involving totally over 50,000 people from 24 different countries. So when she synthesized the results of all of this, she came up with information that really seems to represent ADC pretty much worldwide. And that's what I'll be presenting here um, briefly. At the same time, Michelle Knight was conducting a qualitative study of 21 ADCers in Sydney, Australia. And uh, if you're interested in hearing, I'm gonna be mentioning a few things from her study, but if you're interested in hearing it from the horse's mouth, Michelle is gonna actually be with us, uh, I believe it's tomorrow, uh, to present her study herself. So if you wanna hear more detail, um, uh, you wanna attend that session. And uh, recently, Evelyn Elsacer and her research team completed a major study in Europe and uh, published their findings online. And uh, at the end of this presentation, you'll see the um, links to all of these resources if you want to look into them more carefully or more closely. <clears throat> so uh, types of ADC. Uh, a very common type is the sense of presence without any specific sensory contact. So this means that the individual, the living person has a very distinct sense that the uh, disembodied person, I, uh, I'm following Michelle's lead to use that term instead of deceased because maybe they're physically deceased but not spiritually. So they are certainly disembodied. Um, that there's uh, this distinct sense of presence with no, uh, no sensory content at all, but a very definite sense that the, the person is here. Um, but then there are experiences with sensory content, and it can be visual, auditory, olfactory, tactile, and it can be a combination of two or more of these. And even within each category, there are a lot of variations. For example, just within visual, um, the living person might see the just from the waist up of the disembodied person or might see their whole body or just their face. Um, they might see them um, 
very solid like you're seeing me now or see them kind of translucent and might see them in their mind's eye or see them actually out in the physical environment. So uh, all these variations just on one sensory type. So there's a lot of variation even within the sensory types of experiences. But then there are symbolic ones. And the reason uh, that butterflies are a theme in this presentation is because they are a common symbolic type of NDE. Um, involving butterflies um, landing on people at very meaningful times and um, other, other uh, kinds of things involving uh, dragonflies, but can also involve things like flowers blooming out of season uh, on the anniversary of a person's physical death. Or um, like in one case, a woman her mother had passed and before she had passed, a couple of years before she passed, she'd given the woman um, like four $50 bills to put in different places to have in case of emergency. Well, after the mother passed, one night the woman used her last $50 bill and, um, and right after that, she and her husband went to Target and as they're turning to walk down the aisle with um, women's makeup, she says to her husband, I feel really nostalgic because my mother and I used to come and, uh, and buy makeup together here. And as they're walking down the aisle, there in front of them is a crisp new $50 bill. So that's a symbolic ADC. Um, and then there are electronic ones where um, this same woman uh, got a like on her Facebook page when she posted her um, photo of her wedding dress, except that her mother, she got the like from her mother's Facebook account, except that her mother had passed uh, several months before the wedding. Um, and uh, there's a book called Telephone Calls from the Dead. People get computer um, messages, um, uh, electronic things, um, something that's been broken inexplicably starts to function at a very meaningful time. Um, so all of those are variations on electronic type ADCs. And usually an ADC is an individual experience, but it can be shared. Um, so uh, there can be um, people who perceive the same thing uh, and uh, maybe at the same time or maybe later, like uh, the first ADC that I ever heard someone talk about individually when I was interviewing them, she was a near-death experiencer. Her name also was Jan, um, but it wasn't me. And um, she, when we finished our interview about her NDE, uh, as we were just like walking to the door, she was telling me this story that after her mother-in-law had passed, she awoke one night to see her mother-in-law standing at the foot of the bed and, um, and her mother-in-law was wearing a jumper, which is a kind of a dress that Jan had made for her that she'd always said was her favorite dress. And uh, there was an extended after-death communication process where the mother went into the oldest child's room and observed the child sleeping and Jan was, you know, followed her and watched her watching the child and then the child started to kind of move and she, so the mother-in-law left the room and went into the baby's room and watched the baby sleeping and Jan followed her and then the baby started to get restless and the mother walked out of the room and walked down the hall and, and um, disappeared and, and had conveyed to Jan telepathically that she was there just to, to make sure everybody was okay. So Jan told her husband about this the next morning and, um, but they decided not to tell anybody in their family about it because they didn't know, you know, how they would react. And um, a few months later, there was a family reunion and it got late at night. People were drinking wine. The kids had all gone to bed and Jan's sister-in-law, so it was her husband's sister, the daughter of the woman who had come to visit Jan, um, said, okay, y'all, I need to tell you something. And they're, they're like, okay. And she said, a few months ago, I woke up in the middle of the night and mom was standing at the end of the bed. 
And she conveyed to me that she was there just to check on everybody and make sure that we were all doing okay. And she turned to Jan and she said, you know the weird thing, Jan? I know that after mom died, you gave away all her clothes to charity, but she was wearing that jumper that you made for her that she always said was her favorite dress. So that's an example of a kind of a shared after death communication where what people perceived is verified. And these experiences can be veridical. They can be, um, people can get information in an ADC that uh, was just unavailable uh, from through any physical means and ends up um, being correct. Uh, people have found uh, hidden wills, hidden um, insurance policies, hidden guns, uh, and uh, other kinds of things that um, that no living person had known where it was, but uh, in the ADC, the living person got the information and then found the object. So um, circumstances of ADC, all states of health from being perfectly healthy to being on one's deathbed, all states of consciousness, anything you can imagine, waking, sleeping, meditation, blah, blah. And of course they do, uh, ADCs happen very frequently in near-death experiences, people meet deceased loved ones. Um, sleep ADC may be the most common, and you'll notice that I'm not calling it dream ADC because uh, what ADCs that happen while we're asleep tend not to be at all like our other, like our normal dreams. Uh, for one thing, after a dream, I look back on it if I remember it, and I think that wasn't real. But if I look back on a sleep ADC, uh, my tendency is to think that it was real and maybe to be even adamant about that. Um, and whereas dreams are very ephemeral, they're hard to remember. Um, you might remember it in the morning and then by evening you think, I had an interesting dream last night, I can't remember what it was. ADCs tend to remain fixed and unchanging in memory over decades. So uh, in English, we have just one word for uh, experience during sleep and that's um, dream. I think in Persian, they've really got it better. They have two words for sleep experiences. One is roya, which means a dream, and the, the other is royahe sedehe. Pardon me if I'm um, butchering Persian, and if you know Persian and I'm butch butchering it. But anyway, that means a true vision. So it's like they acknowledge that these two different kinds of experiences can happen in sleep, and they are qualitatively different. They, they call for different terms to explain what they are. And so ADCs fall into that second uh, category. Frequency, uh, the ADC may occur only once for somebody or might happen multiple times to the same person with only one disembodied loved one or maybe more than one. Um, and usually, but not always, they decrease over time. Um, incidents, meaning how often does ADC occur following a particular incident, uh, the incident being the loss of a loved one. Um, in the first year after the death of a loved one, about three-fourths of people report ADC, so it's very common. Prevalence, which means if you just walk down the street and say, ask somebody, have you ever experienced ADC, presuming they know what it is, at least one-third of people report ADC sometime in their life. So again, very common uh, experience worldwide. And just a note about the role of culture that uh, ADC is reported more often in cultures that are friendly to it. Um, and we don't know whether it's because people actually have the experience more in those cultures or they just feel safer to report it. Um, Ex other experience or demographics, ADC occurs to both bereaved and non-bereaved people. Uh, the incidence is higher among the bereaved, but it can happen to people who are not grieving at all. Um, it happens for both men and women, but it is reported more by women. And again, we don't know if it's because they experience it more or just that they are, feel safer or braver. To, dis, to report that they've had the experience. Um, otherwise, it's an equal opportunity experience. It occurs to every uh, demographic you can think of pretty much equally. And um, there is no relationship between ADC and mental disorders. So that's really an important 
um, an important um, fact to know. So um, the effects of ADC are overwhelmingly positive. Uh, Jenny noted that people described ADCs as pleasant, elating, positive, comforting, and healing. Those were the most common words that people used to de um, describe their ADCs. And Michelle found that uh, these experiences have an effect on people's belief in the survival of consciousness after physical death. If they already believed it, the ADC affirmed it. And if they didn't believe it, then they tended to change uh, into believing in the survival of consciousness after death. So these have very, um, very definite effects on people. Um, and I did a study uh, assessing the extent to which ADC affected people's sense of the, the fruit of the spirit, uh, meaning love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is from the Bible. And um, that the vast majority of people reported that the ADC either increased or strongly increased at least one, if not multiple, of these um, characteristics. So um, again, these the uh, after effects of ADC just tend to be very um, positive and uh, helpful, beneficial to people. Uh, there are cases of negative or distressing responses to ADC. They're unusual, but they do happen. Most often, it's because the person is confused or afraid because they lack information about ADC, or they may have misinformation about it, like that it's somehow related to mental illness, for example. Um, and Or they might have a belief system that is incompatible with ADC. And so they've had this experience, it was wonderful, but somehow it contradicts um, what they believed is possible or should be happening. Um, this maybe is most often the case for people uh, affiliated with a conservative religious view that um, in which they may think that um, ADC is considered uh, somehow evil or of the devil. Um, but again, research shows that it's overwhelmingly spiritually developmental. So there are disclosure issues uh, when people want to tell, talk about their ADC, uh, there can be challenges. Now, uh, healthcare professionals have an ethic and many people have a personal moral to do no harm to others. What we know from research on near-death experiences is that someone uh, who discloses their NDE to a confidant, the way that confidant responds can harm the NDE or and harm the integration process like uh, that uh, Janie was just talking about. Um, although we haven't done this exact study with ADC, I've heard exactly the same kind of stories from ADCers that I had heard from NDEers where they um, confided their ADC to someone and the person, um, they felt harmed because the person either failed to recognize what they were talking about as an ADC, dismissed it as invalid or unimportant, oh, you were just imagining, you were just um, grieving and, and really minimizing its uh, psycho-spiritual psycho importance, um, diagnosing the ADC or the experiencer as having a mental disorder, or being evidence of a mental disorder, or demonizing the ADC as evil or of the devil. And research explicitly does not support any of these things. And yet, um, that's, that's sometimes how confidants respond. So you will be revisiting these ideas later in, uh, at the end of the presentation. So some recent media coverage of ADC um, I'm starting with something that uh, came out on January 29th, uh, which was an article in a magazine called The Walrus, written by Patricia Pearson. And even though something happened a few days earlier that we're going to get to in a minute, that thing happened because this article was coming out. And um, this, if you want to read the actual article, here's the, the URL to it. And um, what 
Noelle and I saw strengths of this article is uh, that uh, Patricia does an especially good job of reviewing the early history of ADC research. Um, but there, we saw a couple of weaknesses too. Uh, she didn't give as much attention to current research, which you can see there's been a lot of it and she just doesn't even mention it. And, um, and in the early research, uh, there's a frequent reference to grief hallucinations and nowhere in the article could we find that Patricia like countered the um, the use of that terminology and well I'll talk about that more in just a minute. Um, so what happened a few days before the release of that article was on January 11th, uh, Chris Boyd interviewed Patricia Pearson on the KERA radio uh, program Think, and um, here's the URL if you want to uh, read uh, hear the. Um, the interview. And the strengths of it are that overall, uh, we thought that ADC was accurately represented and appropriately positively represented with, you know, mention of distressing experiences, but how they're overwhelmingly positive for people healing and giving a sense of reconnection and all those kinds of things. Uh, but uh, some weaknesses is that Patricia herself repeatedly used the term hallucination. The problem is that ADCs are not hallucinations. And so I'm uh, following Grayson's um, uh, comparison of NDEs and hallucinations in his book, After, uh, which uh, this is a little confusing because this the comparison I'm doing is uh, like following his example after Grayson, but after Grayson's book, After. <laughs> and so if we compare hallucinations to ADC, um, after a hallucination, the person considers the hallucination to have been unreal. Uh, absolutely. It's just very rare for anyone to think that what they experience, even though it felt real at the time, doesn't feel real now. But after an ADC, the person usually considers it real. And as I said, is often adamant that the experience is real. Like, don't try to tell me that ADCs I've had aren't real. Um, usually hallucinations are distressing in their content, whereas usually ADCs are profoundly pleasurable in their content. There's, as I said, a sense of reconnection and healing and um, um, joy. Um, so it's, uh, the, it's a, um, by and large, a very positive experience. The memories of hallucinations fade just like the uh, memory fades of normal um, experiences, whereas memories of ADC remain vivid for um, decades. I can tell you in detail a sleep ADC I had 30 years ago. It was a very detailed story, and I can tell you all of it again, including a poem that was in the story, in the um, sleep ADC. Uh, hallucinations, the person has no wish to reflect on the experience. They don't want to go back and think about, you know, why they had that hallucination or what, what was in there for them. Uh, whereas usually people have a strong wish to reflect on their ADC. And um, there are no specific after effects to hallucinations. Whereas we know from research, as you just saw in that slide, that there are some very um, uh, identifiable beneficial after effects. And of course, the term hallucination is associated with mental disorder. And as we said, ADC is not associated with mental disorder. Now, that doesn't mean that people with mental disorders don't have ADCs. They do, but at no greater frequency than, uh, than, um, other, than people who are free of mental disorder. So uh, finally, uh, on June 20th, John Blake's article came out on the CNN um, webpage, Health. Uh, they lost their loved ones to COVID and then they heard from them again. And um, here's the link to that. Uh, and by the way, I'm going to try to make the handout to this PowerPoint available to you. So uh, um, I'll, I'll be figuring out how to do that. Um, talking with the conference organizers. 
And the strengths of this article are that, uh, again, they give an overall accurate repre representation of ADCs, representing them as predominantly positive, acknowledging they're occasionally distressing, but really an accurate uh, based on what everything we know from research. Um, ADCs are consistently referred to as experiences. Never once does the author refer to them as hallucinations. The word hallucination appears once in the whole article, and it's an ADCer talking about hearing his uh, wife in the middle of the night um, say, wake up, John, and he wakes up and he is absolutely sure that that was her voice. He says, you may think you may want to call this an auditory hallucination, but I know that that's her really communicating with me. So even he is, uh, this um, experiencer is inadvertently um, strengthening the point that we're making that the word hallucination just does not fit um, ADC. And um, several cases that are described in the article, stories of different ADCs, are provided by a hospice social worker, Scott Jansen, who has written several articles for popular magazines in different venues about ADCs and other um, nearing death kinds of uh, phenomena. Weaknesses, um, we really couldn't find any. So we really, really um, recommend this article along with some resources that we're gonna get to in just a slide here. Um, so first of all, how, what is the recommended way to respond if somebody discloses an ADC to you? So to avoid harming us a disclosing adc -er, don't disregard the experience, the, what they're describing, do recognize it and offer the label ADC, not of course hallucination, but say something to the person like, it sounds like you had something what's, that's called an after death communication. Um, this is like a thing that's known in case the person seems to not know that these things happen. Um, don't dismiss the importance of the experience, do affirm it's, excuse me, it's importance and value to the experiencer um, saying things like, um, you know, it sounds like you felt a really wonderful sense of reconnection and that's, uh, that's really common for after death communication. It's important. It sounds like that's something you're gonna be able to take with you going forward in life. Um, don't pathologize the person or the experience. Confirm to them that ADC is unrelated to mental disorder. And don't demonize. Do convey that ADC is usually spiritually beneficial to people. Um, again, um, enhancing those fruit of the spirit qualities of love, joy, peace, and so forth. And so recommended resources. When Jenny finished her dissertation, I said to her, so now you've read everything that has been published on ADC through 2010. Um, if I were to ask you, if I were going to read only one thing about ADC, what would you recommend? And she recommended Bill Guggenheim and Judy Guggenheim's book, Hello from Heaven. And the reference to this is in, in a slide here in a minute. Um, there's also a concise overview of ADC uh, in a chapter that I wrote uh, in a book called Connecting Soul, Spirit, Mind, and Body. And this chapter is available to read for free online. And um, again, those two booklets by Evelyn L. Sacer and her research team, uh, one of the booklets is Cases that they present and the other is an overview of research findings like the the um, statistics and that sort of thing.